Hello, it's another edition of A Lot of Help, the video version, and I am James Hudson, your host, and I am a certified life coach, professional organizer, former nurse, as you guys know all the things I've done before, but today I'm with someone who is a friend to the show, who has been on several times over the years, we've had some great conversations, we're being reunited, so I'm very happy to have him back on the show, Director of Vision of Cardiology at the, uh, at the Southern California Hospital Heart Institute here in Culver City, we're here in his office here in Culver City, Professor of Medicine at UCLA, Clinical Professor of Medicine at UC Riverside and Physician Professor of Medicine at Cedar sinai so all the major places he is doing it. He's also out and about, he's doing talks and workshops and things, and I'm so happy to have him on my show again because he's my friend, Dr. Ernst Schwartz. Ron Schwartz, how are you? Thank you, James. I'm glad to see you again. Good to see you, too. We're just talking because, like we said, we follow, we follow each other online, right. and I have lost weight, which many of you know my journey. I've been posting my journey over the last year and a half, and I decided to do it slowly. I was telling you how you asked me how I did it, and I decided to do it slowly and just kind of methodically and not just try to lose weight really fast, and I know that doesn't work. And for me, it was all about lifestyle, which is what you well, know about all about that. Absolutely. I mean, I agree with you, and I mean, we often underestimate really the, the power of our will and our own discipline. Yes. And I mean I have patients every day coming to the office with certain conditions, in particular the metabolic syndrome, meaning diabetes, yeah. overweight, abdominal fat, uh, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, all these are risk factors for the heart. And yes. as a cardiologist, of course I see the results of those risks, which is coronary artery disease, unstable angina, heart attack, strokes, and so on, the whole yes. story. So um, there is no miracle pill nope. to treat that. Nope. Um, and in, in addition to the medical therapy, um, of course, we need diets, we need physical activity, exercise, and we need the right mindset. The mindset's very important, isn't it? Absolutely. I Absolutely. agree with him. That was something that for me, it was like, something clicked for me. It was like when the doctor said, your blood pressure is this much, <laughs> and your weight is this much, when I hurt my weight, that's what scared me a little bit. Yeah. It was like, you're 303 pounds. I was like, 300? I've never 303 pounds my entire life. I, like, and it's one of those things I talk about there, it can slowly creep up. Like, you just kind of like, all of a sudden, it feels like you're 303 pounds, but it did happen over a course of time. And so I had to learn, it'll take a course of time to get rid of it. Right. right. That's the mindset. You can't just give yeah, it I mean, tomorrow. Especially with the weight loss, I agree with you, James. I mean, oftentimes people think, I mean, uh, they need to lose 20, 30, yeah. 40, 50 or more pounds. It should go quickly. That oftentimes does not work. Yeah. I mean, the quicker people lose it, the quicker they might gain again. Yes. But in general, we talked about this earlier, yeah. and you mentioned your goal was one pound per week, and that's reasonable. And we, we actually published a couple of years ago a paper in, in circulation, where we, which is one of the major um, medical journals in the cardiovascular field from the American Heart Association, where we compared the different types of diets with regard to cardiovascular health. And there is no prime solution, but in general, to I mean, it would take hours, but briefly, yeah. um, the low-fat diets, in yeah. my opinion, don't work well. No. Uh, Low-carb does work with regard to, to weight loss. The healthiest diet, as far as we know nowadays, for the cardiovascular health is what we call the Mediterranean diet. I wish I know. And that's not basically one defined type of diet because there's like uh, several countries surrounding the Mediterranean that's true. Okay, that's true. You're right. individual uh, that's true. portions to it but what it means in general is definitely uh, more vegetables more fresh salads less red meat yes olive or a little red wine you know and smaller portions more frequent meals rather that's than right. just one big meal in the evening so that is probably the most heart healthiest diet which we have available. And I kind of, I, that's kind of what I did. I mean, I didn't know it was Mediterranean, but I kind of, that's what I kind of did. I did smaller portions, that was, and I ate more frequently, which now my body's used to it now. Now it's like, oh, it's been three hours, have a little something. Oh, now it's been three hours, have, and I'm used to that now. And I like that, I don't eat late at night anymore. That's a good idea. I mean, the, the other misconception is often people don't eat, and I did the same mistake, okay. I have to admit. I mean, I thought, well, if I don't eat, if I don't consume calories, then, uh, I wouldn't gain weight, I would lose weight. That's actually not true. Mm. Uh, fact is, you have to um, 
up titrate the activity of your metabolism basically. So if you don't eat for 12 hours but have a, one big meal at night you actually gain weight or you might gain weight while if you have like you mentioned James a small portion but every three four hours maybe a little nuts here and there yes. and a little fruit or vegetables yeah. here that keeps your metabolism going meaning you burn more calories you eat you don't feel hungry and you won't gain but you will lose weight but if you keep 12 hours fasting but then have a big yes. uh, bowl of spaghetti at right. night time right. which we all have done yeah, we've done, yeah we've done um, that doesn't help much yeah. so small portions more frequently but the more healthier food choices mm -hmm. as you do and I learned from me don't bring in the house anything you shouldn't be eating when I bring it in the house, I'm going to eat it. I mean, it's, 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 I feel like if I bring it in the house, I won't eat it that much. You tell yourself that, <laughs> then you go to it. So I try to bring this to my house that's, that's you know, it's kind of, if you can. I know some people live with other people. I live with my brother, and he has his own food. I have my own food, so I can do that. But I know it's not always easy. But I'm going to ask you, kind of leading into that section, what is the deal? How do you discern between gas, extreme gas, palpitations and anxiety when it comes to the heart like there is sometimes it kind of overlap in, in the symptoms or feelings so I always wonder about that so I get a lot of questions about this so I'm gonna ask yeah, him yeah. I get a lot of that's, questions about that's, this. that's a great question James thanks for bringing this yeah. up it's actually not an easy distinction yeah right? sure so, right um, we have a lot of people especially younger people nowadays who come with uh, or were referred by their primary physicians to check the heart because of anxiety and they feel mm. palpitation. So oftentimes it's actually the other way around. Mm. You know, people mm -hmm. can have arrhythmia, meaning irregularities of the heart rhythm could be congenital. Oh, right, 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 right. Or required. Um, and so out of nowhere, suddenly the heart be, be starts pumping very fast or fast and irregular, and that causes anxiety. Mm -hmm. It could be the other way around too. Of course, we know anxiety can make the heart beat faster, but from the pure uh, description or presentation of the patient, we won't be able to distinguish this. So, in other words, if you have palpitation, if you feel your heart irregular or you feel it's racing, then we always suggest have a check by a cardiologist. Get at least an EKG. Sometimes you might need what we call like a halter monitor okay. for 24 hours or longer okay. to uh, make sure that there is no other irregularity. Sometimes we do echoes, ultrasounds of the heart mm -hmm. muscle um, because if there's any uh, morphologic abnormality that can go hand in hand with an electrical abnormality and in some cases we also want to make sure that irregularities are not caused by lack of oxygen. So we might mm -hmm. add a stress test to rule that out. So it's there's different nuances test. to that, but um, it's too easy to say, oh, you, you're anxious, that's why your heart is palpitating. <laughs> right. That's not really a reason. Yeah. Um, now, what about gas? Because there is severe gas. Well, there is that similar, feels. like you said, yeah. It feels like gas or GERD. Yes. You know, people have like heartburn, and mm -hmm. there's a reason why it's called heartburn. Mm -hmm. It's actually not burning the heart, it's burning the esophagus. Yes. Um, but it feels like heart pain and similarly to the palpitations it is almost impossible just from the description of the symptoms to distinguish whether this is a GERD problem, a gas indigestion problem or a problem of the oxygen supply to the heart. Yeah. So oftentimes the, the patient's history, the family history father had a heart attack, mother had a heart attack at age 40 or so, that helps, of course, but it doesn't rule anything out. Okay. So um, even for us it's sometimes difficult to, to really understand where is it coming from, is it from the heart, from the esophagus, right. from the gas, from whatever, but again, um, in those cases we have very simple, easy, short-lived testings available to distinguish this and then direct the, the therapy if any yeah. is needed. Yeah, because I, I, mean, I know some people, it could be your diet, it could be, I mean, I mean, sometimes there is severe gas sometimes, so it's better to go into the doctor, get checked out, and then if it's just gas, you can take care of that. Well, I believe it or not, I just did an angiogram on a patient okay. an hour ago okay. here in the hospital across the street uh, who told me the same thing. His only symptom was actually indigestion. He felt a little pressure in the upper abdomen and thought, oh, well, that's gas. Yeah. It turned out actually it got worse overnight, and then at four o'clock it got to a point where he was throwing up. Um, oh, wow. And um, so 
His wife called 911. He was brought to the emergency room and turned out that he had elevated enzyme, meaning a, a small heart attack. Right. So the whole abdominal symptomatology was actually caused by lack of oxygen in the heart. So we did an angiogram. He had one blockage, 99 blockage, and the widowmaker yeah. artery uh, oh, put wow. a stand in. Okay. It's all good now. But uh, I would not have expected that from the symptoms the patient told me initially, but we wanted to make sure. And in that case, well, you see, I mean, it, it was a good thing that he had invasive diagnostics done. Yeah, thank God. Um, now, are there different types of heart attacks and cardiac arrest? Is there a different type? Oh, yeah. So, um, cardiac arrest is not the same like a heart attack, okay, but a heart attack can lead to cardiac arrest. So, heart attack by definition means nothing else than part of the heart muscle die. We have a heart there. Shall I just go? Oh, yeah, get the heart. Get it. Yeah, yeah let's so get it Part of the, the heart muscle, this is like the heart muscle part yes. of that might die. Because one of the arteries in red here might have a blockage somewhere here. Okay. So if, if there's a blockage here in this artery to the front of the heart, um, then this portion of the heart would not be supplied with oxygen. Uh, okay. And if this lasts more than an hour or so, then all this muscle would be that. So heart attack means dying muscle, usually caused by lack of oxygen. So um, if that happens, or if we assume that that's the case, and we go in with the catheter through the groin or through the arm and go into the artery and open that blood vessel up. Got it. So that's like the classical okay. large heart attack. Okay. And then there's what we call the non-STEMIs, non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarctions. That means basically like a small heart attack, which we cannot detect when we do an EKG, but we only see by lab testing. So we do a blood test okay. and certain enzymes of the heart might be elevated. And then there's what we call or formally called angina or unstable angina, for her, that, yes. which is usually the, the typical chest pain often distributed into the jaw and the shoulders or the left arm, which is a symptom. It's not a diagnosis. It's a symptom of, for example, a heart attack or a pending heart attack. Mm. Cardiac arrest, you ask about that, James, yeah. means the heart suddenly stops. Got it, okay. There can be other reasons. Uh, okay. could be a heart attack, but uh, could be a pulmonary embolism, could be um, an electrical abnormality where the heart suddenly flatlines or does the opposite, goes into ventricular fibrillation, which also equalizes to, a, to a basically a cardiac arrest. And that's acutely life-threatening. Yeah, okay. Now, last thing I want, I want to ask you, I mean, just kind of, I mean, I know it's a large subject, but I'm just kind of curious, what's happening with stem cells these days? I know you went to a seminar recently in Newport Beach, I think, or something. So. Well, I, I've been involved uh, with stem cells since the, the very beginning, yeah, actually. Yeah. Uh, you might know that the first large stem cell trial data were published in around 2000, so 20 years, almost 20 years ago. Yeah. But we were involved in this much earlier. We were actually among the first in the world using embryonic cells in experimental animals where we created heart attacks and we could show that if we inject embryonic fetal cardiomyocytes uh, or stem cells in an infarcted heart muscle that we can recuperate contractile function wow. and we can basically reduce scar tissue. That was wow, okay. uh, in 1998 uh, wow, when the papers were published. Um, one of the, the early studies which ever showed benefits of stem cell therapy and that created the whole hype. So there's a lot going on now um, worldwide in stem cell research and we are heavily involved in that. Yeah. Um, and it's not what you what you read if you okay. Google it, because okay. um, there's two different portions to it. One is, of course, all the advertising on, on stem cell therapies, which costs a lot of money. And uh, let me say that none of this is FDA approved. Got it. Okay. It's not it. forbidden to do it, but right. it's not widely recommended. Okay, good to know. Um, the, the other portion of, is, of course, all the multi-center trials, which are partly NIH, but the government funded. Um, if we look at all the trial data on stem cells for whatever condition, diabetes, strokes, heart diseases, erectile dysfunction, you name it, every single study published so far shows benefits. Okay. Just so I know. personally, okay. I have no doubt that stem cell therapy is, is uh, the, the promise of the future uh, with the huge potential which we have not even 
caught up yeah, into. Yeah, sure. On the other hand, there is still a lot to do and I would be always careful just to listen to advertisements okay. or, or announcements on the web mm -hmm. where people claim without really having scientific data. Um, uh, we are working on that, we are working closely with, with, with the FDA together and there's black sheep in the business and there's the good guys, yes, you know, yes. and um, uh, we support everything which has scientific evidence, but we don't support that which is purely based out of business interests. Exactly. Good, I'm glad you said that. Dr. Rossworth, thanks for being on the show. Thank you so Always much. informative, always informative, always great. The heart is very important. We need one <laughs> to live. Absolutely. And we got to take care of the ones we have and, 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 go, and my, my whole thing is, you feel something weird, go to the doctor. Go to the doctor, go to the doctor. Don't try to self-diagnose, don't try to brush it off. Go to the doctor, right? I agree with you. Thank Ugh. you so much, James. Thanks for being on the show. Pleasure seeing you again. Good to see Thank you, you too. Good luck to Thank you. you.